Hey, it's Dr. Scott Langford from the Stanford Gen Channel. I'm thrilled to be interviewing a former Foothill student, Cynthia Branval, who is now my own colleague here at Foothill College. Um, she's in art history, I'm in English. She went on to UC Berkeley and then most recently completed a degree at San Francisco State. I wanted to interview her here for the Stanford Gen Channel for two reasons. One is that as a visual artist, I think that the intersectional and international nature of her art is I, an ideal conversation starter for those of us that want to internationalize the curriculum for community college students. Two, as a writing teacher, and as in fact one of Cynthia's former composition and writing instructors, I have been thrilled to see how she integrates composition pedagogy, writing, writing prompts into her work as an art history professor. So with those two things in mind, I'm going to go ahead and let Cynthia begin to introduce herself to you and her work, which crosses uh, so many international boundaries in the African American diaspora, in the Afro-Caribbean diaspora, um, in European and in American art history, and African art history in all directions. So welcome, Cynthia, to the Stanford Gen channel. Thank you so much for having me, Scott, and it's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you again. It's something for me, this is like, this is like a dream come true to be interviewing your own students at this level. So, so catch me up a little bit too, because even though I've known you for quite a long time, we lost contact until you started coming back to Foothill to teach and we kind of like encountered each other and that was such a thrill for me. Um, so there's, I am aware that there's a ton of stuff in your career that I'm, that I'm not fully up to date on. I've gotten little snapshots from interacting with you as my new colleague but I'm really, really looking forward to learning more about what you've been up to. So I, I started with this big question of like, here we are talking about internationalizing the curriculum for community college students and instructors. And I realized that's a huge question. So let me just kind of roll that in your direction and see where you want to go first. Okay. It is a huge um, question. And I thought it was really insightful and perceptive of you to kind of tether the art history and the art practice together okay. because um, there is a conceptual um, underpinning to both of those those projects of mine um, as a result of pursuing a, a you know higher education so I'll just, I've kind of put together a little presentation to sort of tell the story of how I have come to this moment, I guess, the things that were influenced me. Um, but essentially, uh, I'll just, you know, I'm here at Foothill. Um, I have become a generalist in terms of uh, teaching non-Western art history um, trying to be inclusive in my approach of teaching art history to bring in LGBTQ, to bring in um, disability um, uh, activism into the curriculum. So for me, it's not just um, an ethnic, it's a larger project of bringing marginalized voices um, in, into the discourse of art history. Um, and part of that has been to become sort of a generalist and to be able to teach the canon of Western art history, but also non-Western art history. Um, and, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll even just interject while you're getting ready to screen share that I, one of the great pleasures for me of being a community college instructor deeply is that one has a license to be a little bit more of a generalist because of course we're often mostly teaching introductory level courses mm -hmm. and survey courses and being a generalist is part of the job description right and that doesn't mean that you don't have really very specific expertise also or that hopefully i do too right but 
the ability to teach across disciplines in an intersectional manner, and especially because our students themselves are so diverse and so intersectional and bring so many identities into the classroom, um, makes it a really beautiful place to teach. I'm still just, you know, having heart flutters over the fact that I get to interview you as my colleague. Um, so, so, and I'm so glad you did bring visuals because I've been stunned just watching your um, social media feeds, learning more about who you are again, um, really amazed at the work that you've been doing as a visual artist, which is the part that's most new to me mm -hmm. as someone who knew you from X years ago. Yeah, and I'll just continue our little community college love fest. Oh, fine with me. That's what we're all about here on the Gen Channel. <laughs> yeah, because I think that when I was um, pursuing my degrees and studying, I really started thinking about impact. Mm. And um, you and I have talked about the challenges of um, challenging biases that are inherent in certain disciplines in academia. And uh, I know for me that I got to a point where I really asked myself, you know, do I want to convince 12 people in the ivory tower or can I have a larger impact with um, a generation? Yeah. Uh, so I love being at community college. I feel like I have married my community college sweetheart. <laughs> that's interesting because that's a metaphor that I've often used having been married to the community college system now for 30 years, having kind of run off and eloped. So um, it's, that's one of those many little rhyming parts of our careers that I, that I take um, great pleasure in. And you know, really what I think you'll find out too is that you can do both, right? Like you can still have, as I have a research life and a publication life and go to specialized conferences and teach to a really broad audience and write for a broad audience because you're not only talking to specialists in your field exclusively. And I, I you know, I still love that about community college teaching. So. I'm glad you joined me in this like very pleasurable, this very pleasurable uh, career path that we have. So I start with this quote from um, Glissant, and he is a Caribbean philosopher and theorist. I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with him. Um, and I was thinking it was such a, a good segue because he has this definition of rhizomatic thought um, that it's the principle behind what I call the poetics of relation in which each and every identity is extended through a relationship with the other. And so this is sort of a fundamental um, guiding idea that really affects my approach in academia and in my own art practice. And I'll come back to this and talk about what that means um, a little bit more. I love this quote because as you know, I'm, I'm very deeply involved in eco-philosophy and eco-critical criticism. And so the rhizomatic thought and the, and the organic nature of that is really beautiful. But I wanna make sure that students that are watching this, for example, who don't happen to be biology majors or aren't into gardening, yeah. are aware that rhizomes are these tiny filament filaments or fibers that, that interconnect in root systems and literally bring in nutrients. It's very symbiotic. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's kind of un invisible to humans because it happens under the ground and yet it is absolutely fundamental. So it's a beautiful, deep ecological metaphor for the power of networks, right? Yes for that, that thinking does not happen in a vacuum. In fact, quite the opposite, any more than a plant can just sort of grow in the air without, without interacting not only with the soil, but with all kinds of other organisms that create the soil. So it's a, that is a powerful and beautiful quote that you selected to begin with. Thank you for showing me, thank you for um, showing me uh, Monsieur Bisson's, um wonderful thought there. I'm going to have to go back and try to puzzle it out in French too. <laughs> well, what 
I'll say about it is, um, you know, it, the reason that I like to engage in it is I was really looking for a way to um, engage in identity and specifically black identity in a way that was not locked into a binary of um, white wow black, or center and marginalized or colonizer yeah and colonized. Um, and so I was looking for a theoretical framework that would allow me to uh, engage in black identity, diasporic identity in relation to everything, but not according to the terms uh, set forth by a Eurocentric point of view. And Yes, so fantastic. that's why I was really, um, really interested in Glissant. So what I've kind of prepared is just a little bit of my journey. I'm gonna talk about my undergraduate research at UC Berkeley a little bit, and then my graduate research, and then kind of segue to my art practice. That's kind of my goal for this talk. So I'll start with this quote, just to kind of set the groundwork. So we're looking at um, here a painting by uh, Guillaume Guillaume Latier, The Oath of the Ancestors a neoclassical painting and i've given you um a quote that i really like from um rashid arin um in terms of modernity and when that was imposed these notions of these enlightened ideas that they equipped themselves to get rid of colonialism so this painting depicts Alexander Pétion and Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Um, they are thought of as the fathers of the Haitian Revolution, and they're standing on either side of a stele, which has the opening words of the um, Haitian constitution. You've got this image of a god figure uh, coming through the clouds and broken chains in, um, in the foreground. and this is a painting that uh, my mentor, Darcy Grigsby, uh, wrote about and studied. She was my mentor um, at UC Berkeley in art history. And it's an interesting um, story. Just talk about it a little bit. Um, so the artist is pictured here in this sketch by Ong on the bottom, and he was um, his, his father was a French colonial and his mother was an ex-slave. And he is the one that painted this. He's a contemporary of Jacques-Louis David, one of the probably the most famous neoclassical painter. And um, he actually went to court to petition to even be able to use his father's surname. So there's a whole interesting story about the artist um, himself. And he was assimilated into French academic and cultural um, life completely. I have this um, picture by Giraudet of uh, Jean-Baptiste Bellet because he uh, was also a very important figure who went to, um, gosh, I don't have all my notes in front of me, but he went to the a French convention to sort of advocate for um, the, the freedom of the uh, black population. So, and he was considered to be, um, you know, the mixed race or mulatto class of people at that time. It didn't have to do whether you were mixed race, but whether you were free or not. And so uh, one could attain their freedom through like military service. This is a huge compact history. I'm not gonna, <laughs> um, all that's there, as I'm sure you know, um, but I do want to kind of give a little bit of context for what I was thinking about. So I studied this. Well, yeah, and I'll just interject too that the the visuals really speak so powerfully of the implicit kind of like the implicit uh, white supremacy in in Enlightenment thinking, right? Like in both, we have this kind of the you know white god figure on one side and and uh 
Grenal, who was one of the great French um, anti-racist activists standing behind Belay, I mentioned to you I have this passion project that I call Black Paris on medium.com. So I wrote, um, I wrote a pretty long article about Belay, and I, I agree, it's incredibly complicated. But I think if you're new to this discourse, if you haven't seen these paintings, and if you don't know, you know, a heck of a lot about the French Revolution and its aftermath and the role that Haiti played, yeah. um, just the visuals alone speak so powerfully to the complexity of the situation. These really powerful American figures and the first Americans in Paris. I mean, if you were in Paris prior, you know, prior to 1776, they didn't think of Americans as these people from the from the 13 British colonies, Americans were free Haitians of it, color. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, oh, I'll tell you all. I'm happy, I'm happy to tell you all about it. But the, the long history of the long history of empowerment of at least certain uh, a certain Haitians within French society based on their status as free or slave, but also on their on the economic on the economic power that they were able to we to wield, and the political power, as with Belay, who had deep influence. Right, and so I'll just say a couple of things, um, you know, about this painting of Jean Baptiste Belay. It's interesting that, um, and you kind of unpacked why that bust of Reynal is there. What's always been interesting to me about that painting as well is the sensuality that's inscribed on Belay's body. Like, is that really necessary? You know, in case you didn't notice, you know, his physique, all of the lines in his arm pointing, bringing your attention there, the um, contrast and the folds of his pants directing us to kind of um, have this sort of sexualized overlay which is part of the um, biases and, and problems of that. And then I'll just say about Oath of the Ancestors, you know, it is a very neoclassical painting in the sense that there is this depiction of realistic space, even though it's a complex image with a lot going on, it's sort of pared down. There's a, a calm, calmness to the composition. In other words, we're like, we're not in the throes of the battle. It's almost like staged in a way, right? And and of course, the white god imagined, you know, is, um, is also speaks to that sort of bias. So mm -hmm. I was looking at this painting, I'll just say a little bit more, was that this was never exhibited in France. And oh. it's really speaking about uh, Professor Romaldo Grigsby's work that, uh, Latier painted this image. It was never, um, he had some success in France, as I said. It was never exhibited um, in uh, France. It was actually smuggled into Haiti by his son. Wow. Or maybe smuggled is too small, too strong of a word, but it was um, discreetly. Um, transported to um to haiti and it was in the presidential suite oh. so my question when i was looking at this painting and studying iconography and studying art history i was really struck by how significant the painting was that it represented this coming together of the mulatto class and the black class and that um it was celebrating the the only slave revolt essentially that resulted in a free nation state they took on the french army and they won and i thought a lot about what this would mean to the people of of haiti and i understood all of the ways in which the iconography spoke to france and the neoclassical aesthetic. But I also, there was a part of me that thought, you know, all knowledge to some extent is constructed. And in terms of signs and symbols and semiotics and even language, right? There's an agreement 
a consensus that we agree to that those things symbolize those things. Yeah. Right. So you can see it so clearly in just these two paintings because they echo each other's iconography almost exactly, including the sexualization of the black body. I note um, the the floating white figure in the air. Uh, so many the 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 military or pseudo military um, costuming, which was also a, a symbol of power but of rebellion. Like it's like it's very interesting. It, um, to just see how completely those two echo each other. Yeah, and those military uniforms modeled um, on French exactly. uh, uniforms. So my question in looking at this painting was, um, you know, if this wasn't shown in France, what did the people of Haiti think of it? What did it mean to them? If they were not educated in neoclassical iconography, how would they interpret this image? And that was kind of the question I started with. And I was exposed in a different class, an art practice class, actually, I was studying with Catherine Sherwood. And let me just skip ahead and I'll come back to it. So this image on the, the right, the Veve Dambala Wedo, um, I was exposed to this in a class where she was talking about um, visionary artist and we watched a movie oh, i can't believe i'm not going to remember the name of it but it's yeah. like um i think her name was maya darren it's a, mo a movie about voodoo um mm. has the term horses in it i'm really sorry that i don't have that piece in my notes but i was we, you know what we can we'll put it in the we can put it in the in the subtitles so yeah. remember i get to go back and put things in on subtitles Perfect. So I was do it that way. <laughs> and for me, there was something about it that was really um, similar to the composition of that painting. And so I, wow. and it, it seemed really out of left field. I didn't know anything about voodoo. I didn't know anything about African iconography or beliefs at all, but on a bones compositional level, there was something. Uh -huh. So I proposed it as a research project. Wow. Just for a second. So what I'm talking about, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll superimpose them and show you what that looks like. I proposed it as a research project and got uh, accepted for a McNair project ended up writing my honors thesis about it and also worked with um, uh, Barbara Martinez, who was a, a faculty at um, Stanford at the time when I was in school. So what I did was I ended up doing a lot of research and it turns out that voodoo, which is a diasporic religion that emerges in San Domingue or what will become um, Haiti, and that in all the places that slaves went, these these kind of uh, diasporic religions arose. So in Cuba, it's Santeria. Um, there's a American voodoo. There's Mayal in Jamaica. I haven't studied all of them. Um, and of course, the slaves came from different. There isn't like a monolithic religion or belief system in Africa. Um, it's very diverse, but there are some fundamental similarities in a, a lot of these religions having to do with ancestors, having to do with this idea of the crossroads. So I'm showing you an African symbol, uh, the basis of the cosmogram in this image that shows those crossroads and the idea that, you know, you have this life where you're a child and you sort of evolve to an adult and become a wise elder, but, and the idea that also in the afterlife, that evolution continues, right? So it, it starts wow. as maybe a memory or an ancestral memory that kind of evolves um, and becomes part of, um, or enmeshed in a larger, I mean, something that we might think of as an archetype, right? Or if we make a reference to a Western model, maybe a saint, not exactly equivalent, but similar. So that, you know, the spirit continues to evolve in the afterlife. And that 
this can that ancestors or these spiritual entities can be accessed and so it turns out that the voodoo ceremonies um, in Haiti were where the they planned the revolution this is where the messages were wow um, and it's very much a part of um, the revolution so this is just to show you there are many different kinds of veves and these are sort of like signatures that are drawn on the ground and through ritual that includes dance um, trance um, that they kind of bring together these the spirit world and the world of the living so that this um, exchange um, can take place. So this is what I was saying about the similar. Oh, look at that! <laughs> of, of <gasps> <position>. Boom! <laughs> Got it. Wow. So this stele and this central, this is called the the Grand Piton in in the ceremony, is the twin road. It's the road where the living and the spirit can kind of communicate. Oh. And the snakes have to do, this is the signature for the ancestors. Actually, this is the veve for the ancestors. And that snake-like energy has to do with energy and, and movement. Um, and so Professor Grigsby really talks um, a lot about the awkwardness of the painting, even though it does adhere to kind of neoclassical standards. So my project was to look at this from a completely different perspective and yeah. to bring in the context of that perspective and what it might mean in a completely different culture. But a culture... You know, I, I just have to say this is an amazing discussion for me already. I do want to add a footnote for students who may be turn, tuning in that, that these, these religions, voodoo, Santeria, are practiced by tens of millions of people today um, across North America, South America, Central America, and also have their roots, as, as Cynthia is making very clear, in many, many religious practices that continue in Africa with tens of millions of people. So these are not by no means minor uh, or obscure religions. And sometimes if you watch too many B-grade Hollywood movies, you have a really uh, negative and racist, I'm going to just say it straight up, view of what, say, voodoo means. And it has nothing to do with the actual power and beauty and depth and complexity of these religious systems, which were brought by enslaved Africans across to the Caribbean and survived deeply in these ways. So it's beautiful to see them surviving in these ways. Talk about rhizomes and roots, right? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about the root that Fred Frederick Douglass is given by uh, his older mentor when he's escaping from slavery. And it's, it's really a key moment in that whole narrative. So, so the roots, I'm, I'm just having too much fun with roots. Yeah. But thank you for showing me this. It's quite mind expanding, um, Cynthia. It's not a, not a part of your work that I was fully aware of. And just based on the little bit that I know about artistic representations of Haitians in Europe, it's completely fascinating to come at it from the other side. Yeah. From what my I, or at Stanford we're called the contact zone, right? Where it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. Yes. So this um, this was my undergrad honors thesis and McNair. Wow. <laughs> no wonder we had to hire you as a professor. And I got <laughs> Departmental citation at UC Berkeley, which was a darn well should have. <laughs> like, I'm writing you one right now. Thank you, thank you. So, um, so now I'm just going to shift a little bit and talk about my graduate research, uh, which is related. I kind of switched from France to America, and I was really studying. Um, I was really interested in identity politics in a broad way, but to, f to be really focused. And I think part of what inspired me to write about this artist collective, and we'll kind of circle back to this idea of the rhizome, was that um, in studying art history, I found that um, 
the way black identity was talked about was as if it was this singular thing. Um, mm. And there was a lot, and, and actually even in the art world and in art history, there is this desire to see black artists as somehow almost performing their difference. Mm. Or, at, you know, there are these uh, post-colonial stars, if you will, who make artwork that is, um, I, I just found when I was studying that, that black artists were constantly being corralled into this space of, you know, what are you making that is expressing black identity as if it's this separate thing, thing. right, which is deeply yeah. connected to this concept of othering um, and the colonized. But I was simultaneously as an artist and as a black person experiencing like black identity to black people is not that. So I felt that they were these two really different things. And I chose to write about this African-American art collective spiral for my master's thesis using uh, glissant as a theoretical framework mm -hmm. to offer a counter um, that black identity from the perspective of black people is diverse and um, not something, you know, not monolithic in any way. And the reason I liked talking about this group um, was that they, well, for one thing, when they exhibited in the 1960s, they came together shortly after a march on Washington to kind of come together and think about what they could offer as black artists towards the efforts of the civil rights movement. And the collective was intergenerational. You had members that had ties to the Harlem Renaissance. You had um, also members who had worked in the WPA who were making abstract work. And you had um, all these various intersections. And the artwork that they made for their one exhibit that they have is also very diverse. So I'm just gonna give you a little glimpse of that diversity. This is uh, Hale Woodruff, um, uh, Africa and the Bull, um, sort of a riff or a play with this idea of the rape of Europa and Reginald Gamon, which this is much more of a political uh, and representative type of style of work. Um, you also have Romare Bearden, who produced a number of collages um, that, this is just one example, but a lot of his works really have an urban feel to them. For me, because he plays around with scale in such interesting ways, there are ways that his works evoke African masks, but there's also kind of a, almost like a musicality in the terms of like faces pop out, hands pop out, it reminds me almost like of horns, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. musical instruments and in jazz. There's kind of a cadence and urban feel um, in his work. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll do one of my little interjections, which I'm happy to do because again, this has to do with the, the nature of community colleges. I've recently been learning much more about the role, which, which I know, and somehow I think it still gets, it gets left aside until recently, like the, the deep role of the, of Bay Area community colleges uh, in black liberation movements of the 1960s. I mean, the Black Panthers came out of community college in the Bay Area. And that includes Foothill College, that includes De Anza, that includes College of San Mateo. In a deep and powerful and profound way, there's a professor at San Francisco State, your alma mater, who has done amazing research in this. But also the ways in which as a literature teacher, I was, I was initially taught to, talk, to approach the Harlem Renaissance as an Americanist, right? Mm -hmm. And to, to shoehorn people into this sort of American literature box in which in fact, they did not see themselves as fitting. So they were in correspondence with French authors. They were in correspondence, of course, with Aimé César and the Negritude Movement. And also yeah. like there's, 
like again, your idea of the multidimensionality of African American experience or African diaspora, a diasporic experience, mirrors my own journey trying to do a better job of understanding what's going on and how to present it um, at a beginner level. Because if you only define the Harlem Renaissance as happening in Harlem, you've essentially falsified it in 19 different ways that the practitioners themselves would not have recognized as being valid. Right. Um, because they, they were incredibly international in their context, in their in, in the in sources of inspiration that they drew from. And they also, do, they also do so much of what you're doing, which is to draw from music and draw from visual arts and draw from literary arts and draw from religion and draw from history and draw from politics simultaneously. Exactly. And all of that was happening in the 60s in the community college system more than almost anywhere else other than San Francisco State, which led the world in creating ethnic studies curriculum. So that's, sorry, I have to wave my flag for Bay Area, for Bay Area academic revolutions, but we really were the epicenter and something to be proud of. And you are part of that now moving forward into the 21st century. Thank you. Yeah, I thought Berkeley was a very political school until I got to, um, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, I love, I love them both, but I'm, you know, San Francisco State was way out ahead in many ways in, in queer theory too, the, another part of the, you know, another part of the practice that I, that I'm part of, or post-colonial theory, which both of us are deeply interested in, so. Totally, totally. So I'll just go back to Glissant for, um, for just a moment, um, you know, that he argues that identity is not located or fixed in culture, but that is something that's continuously transformed mm. in the movement between cultural differences encountered between individuals. And so in a sense, the artist and Spiral were aware, as you were pointing out, of the diasporic experience and that that, ex that had conditioned that in them an openness and an adaptability, perseverance and an inclination towards collaboration. Wow. So, um, which was so opposite of what the discourse from an art history perspective that exactly. saw blackness as something other something consistent right um so yeah. i so i wrote about this group and so you can see i'm sorry some of these are a little bit pixelated i threw this together they had right. one female artist in their group um and but you can see the diversity of the works there right and so the, what was really sad is that at the time the questions that were asked of this collective were, how does your work express black identity? That was really the only thing that want, people wanted to hear and they were actually criticized. They were said to not be cohesive in their collective, in their collection, uh, and they're not cohesive as a um, collective, as an artist collective because they didn't have a consensus of what black identity means. Yeah, and, and presumably this is white intellectuals telling black artists what they're supposed to be doing. Right. All too familiar, right? Like yeah. you're not being black in the way that we I, white intellectuals perceive I, you to do it. Go ahead. Therefore, yeah, you're not authentic, which is just like awfully annoying. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so this is, uh, you know, I wrote my thesis about this collective and um, I'm just going to kind of start to segue a little bit into my own teaching now. This was one of the pieces that was exhibited from Spiral. And it's a piece that I include when I talk about abstract expressionism. And um, so was the collective based in New York, by the way? I mean, I see it's in a New York gallery, but I wasn't sure. Is that was that was it a Manhattan Harlem based collective or were the, where was their base of where or were they from all over the place? Uh, they were from a variety of places, but they did meet in New York and they had one one exhibit in New York. Okay. And a lot of meetings prior to that where they were discussing um, black identity. Um, so this is a piece by Norman Lewis called Processional. Um, it's a piece I really like to uh, teach in abstract expressionism, but I also teach this in my introduction to art 
And I try to think about it in really dynamic ways. So, um, you know, I talk to students about um, the way in which it's kind of like a freeze, right? A band, you know, um, in this sort of background that evokes for me the Greek freeze that was on top of the Parthenon that would have these low relief sculptures that would recount historical uh, tales or, you know, battles between uh, the Athenians and the and the others, right? Or it would just show the Athenians in procession um, so that there's a way in which his work kind of evokes this idea for me as a, as a, as a Greek freeze. That's one way to think about it. And I also juxtapose it to wow. images of the civil rights movement, um, this one by Charles Moore, where you can really see, um, and this iconic image of the civil rights movement and lines would have been all over the news uh, newspapers, it would have been part of the imagination of the public during the time that um, uh, Norman Lewis created Processional. And yet the painting also really adheres to the tenets of abstract expressionism, that it's about abstraction, about mark making, about the materiality of the paint, and in some ways devoid of subject matter. Right, but for me, some of the yumminess of abstraction is the way that we can all find our story within that work. Um, Thank you for that powerful juxtaposition too. That's, once again, it's like, you know, you have the classical allusion to freezes and then bringing in this other, this other voice almost visually and, and historically. It's so powerful to see them conjoined. Um, and it's quite convincing that that's what, that's what is being referenced here, that the rhizomes reach out in all directions. Yeah. Um, right? Yeah, that the roots reach in both directions and that is their power, their power to, their power to syncretically create this, this image that really speaks to so many different dimensions simultaneously. So thank you for that. It's really, that's, that's, that's a powerful, powerful juxtaposition for me. Thank you. There's a scholar, um, Kobina Mercer at um, Yale, who talks about the entanglements of the world. Mm. And I think that that's something that also really stays with me. I don't think that we are isolated and divided in these binaries. It doesn't mean that there isn't oppression, that there isn't um, privilege, you know, those things are absolutely there, but it doesn't mean that the, the meaning that we make is drawing from a variety of perspectives. So kind of shifting to my own work, I'm just gonna show you a textile piece and then I'll kind of talk about the masks and if we have time, I'll come back to the textiles. This is a really interesting piece for me. I started really thinking about this notion of rhizomatic thought and how what how can I how can I express that like what does it look like what would it look like visually how can I take that concept and apply it to my teaching and apply it to my artwork and this is one of the early pieces that I made and it's a simple one um, called rhizome. And the story behind it, though, also speaks to that concept because these are Civil War era handmade lace structures um, that were made by a daughter of the Confederacy. And through a series of relationships ended up in my hands to make this artwork, um, which I just think is interesting. So I got these from a friend who got them from a friend who was wow. um, a, a, one of the daughters of the Confederacy. And so even though she would, you know, I just think it's so interesting that these materials eventually find their way into a black woman's sure. hands who's going to use them in a way probably that they were not, well, certainly that they were not intended. Um, one of the reasons I love this 
way of thinking about the rhizome is and and why I wanted to visualize it in this way is that I like the multiplicity and that I think that we can find more areas of common ground. Um, I also think about this in terms of identity and intersectionality. I think of identity as something plural. Um, so that, you know, I am speaking about myself, you know, I'm a black woman, I am American, I'm a mother, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I'm a scholar, I'm, you know, all of these different things. And when we think of our identity as multiple, then we can have all these other areas of overlap where we can find common ground. Right. And a crinoline is such a, like, that's a word I feel like comes echoing back out of American literature. It's so interesting. I think it was, I think it was made out of several different substances, but cotton would have been one of them, right? Cotton would have been so, one of them. Cotton would have been one of them. It would have been picked by slaves. Yeah. Um, and then, right? Like then, and the roots of that slave system in the cotton plantation industry, et cetera, et cetera, are really interesting to contemplate in that way too. Sorry, this is the literature professor going off on you, but. It's a layer of meaning in my work and my textile works. It's it definitely is, cotton. clearly. Line specifically was used to make hoop skirts. So it's a material that, oh, um, yes. that stiff kind of cotton material. Right. That, and those hoop skirts that we so completely associate with um, the antebellum South. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. So then coming to the masks, I made this, um, this series of work called, uh, I call it the Kindred Spirit Series. And these are, um, these are molds that I made of my face and my daughter's face. And then I, I have poured different uh, racially labeled clay bodies and then, um, you know, done various uh, diasporic veves or things from Santeria. Also done some photo transfer of slave images, uh, cos African cosmograms. Um, so taking that iconography and putting it all onto faces of, of myself and my daughter, but also thinking about that kind of mother and child, you know, mm -hmm. virgin and, and Jesus kind of uh, the Pieta, right? That mother and child, the power of that iconography in our, um, in our imagination. So I've done, a, I did a series, here's another one. Here's that Veve again that I showed you from my undergraduate research. Dambala Weda on my face. And then this is Shango from Santeria. And then these are names of um, people who were killed by police violence on, uh, on my daughter's face. So I, another expression of how can I um, talk about, find this visual form that encompasses all of those aspects of identity, uh, linking the past to the present in powerful ways. You know, I'll say that when I saw these images on your, so or images like them on your social media feed, that's the moment I knew I had to interview you uh, for the Gen channel. But I also, in the way that these interviews can be so powerful for me individually, almost a little selfish is now that you've more fully explained the Vive iconography and those roots, it makes it even more powerful for me. They're, these are remarkable works. And we live, I might add, tragically in an era of masks. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's fascinating that your masks speak to a masked era. Uh, in ways that are in ways that couldn't have been anticipated, but boy, can certainly be called out now. Yeah, I made these four years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's amazing that um, how relevant they really speak to our moment. You know, just they they're so pro they're prophetic. I mean, literally, which Vive 
iconography was meant to be. So, yeah, but seriously, seriously, they speak so powerfully to the moment and to and to many other moments as well. Thank you. Um, so initially, I had made these for an exhibition that I was in called "The Black Woman Is God," and um, they, and again, this was like my personal experience of being a participating artist in an, a black artist collective where the range of expression around black identity experience was completely diverse. It was not monolithic. It was not um, singular in any way. Um, so that was also really uh, an interesting. And I think these are some that you saw recently. I was I have a, a piece in a show in New Orleans at the moment, and I went to um, ship it and realized when I had made these pieces um, for the Black Woman is God, I, you know, a lot can go wrong with ceramics. So I made like, I don't know, 16, and then I ended up exhibiting eight, and then I kind of just dropped the ball. So when I was getting ready to pack up these other ones, I thought, oh gosh, there's more in here that I've never exhibited that, um, you know, with a little bit more work, they can be ready to go. So this is one of the pieces that, um, and these are images of slaves that I have fired on here, these two. And then also I took pictures of the scars from this slave's back and put them, and they didn't kind of translate as much as I wanted them to, but um, I sort of have embellished them with a little bit of paint so these are sort of new in the series um, pieces that I've been working on recently to um, to add to the to the collection. So I think these are the ones that you saw. And then uh, just as a last one, I'll just go. This is a big piece that I've made, 144 by 68 in total, three panels, also made from textiles <clears throat> about textiles as signifiers of labor of cotton. Um, but I think, and, and for me, these continents are my heritage, America, Africa, and Sweden, um, or Europe, and just thinking about these patterns um, as almost like DNA, um, things that migrate through time across continents through the bodies of our ancestors. Um, yeah. Well, again, such remarkable work. I, um, I remain <laughs> amazed and humbled and, and fascinated with your ability to, to take a medium like the masks or the crinoline and continue to explore it at depth with all of these resonances and all these rhizomes and all these directions. It's, it's really beautiful to watch the process of your work as it unfolds, especially because, like, I, again, as I was emphasizing at the top of the interview, this is not a part of you that I have, you know, that I know a lot about. So it's it's kind of being introduced to these other dimensions of your being um, that are completely fascinating to me, and yet they have so many resonances with um, with my own intellectual journey and trying to understand um, these international contexts, but also just with the moment that we're, we're both living through and that your daughter is living through, right? Um, that, that dimension, that generational dimension is also so vivid in your work. So they're not just about the, they're not just works that, that evoke the past. They also evoke the present, but they literally invoke the future also. And it's quite, it, that is another part of their intersectionality, I think, that I find really moving. And you're not done yet either, too. I, you're still exploring. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that we need to find a new way forward. Um, yes. And one that is, um, I mean, our past is with us. You know, it's in our DNA, it's in all of our systems. Um, but I think that we can find better ways of going forward. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for those, for those pathways. 
and finding some truly finding some thank you thank you for being so perceptive and asking me such a deep question i don't often get to talk about my work and my uh teaching and research all in kind of one go and oh yeah and i actually do want to follow up because i'm very curious how do you see this then as informing your teaching at a community college level um because that's the part of you that I know a little bit better, mm-hmm. um, but also because your 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 work is growing so fast in so many dimensions. So how how do you what what have you been doing in terms of uh, in terms of of finding ways to infuse these themes into your teaching as well? Because I know you've been working hard on it. In terms of the art. Well, you know, again, I think that's for you to tell me. I was thinking in terms of art, as a matter of fact, although we've had some fun email back and forth about your writing prompts, which, of course, since that's my gig, yeah, makes me very happy as well. But I'm just curious about um, whatever you might want to bring up in terms of like uh, one or two things that you think you've tried or want to try that um, that speak to that speak to this that speak to how to be how to how to communicate this in a community college classroom with students who haven't necessarily seen the painting of Belay before and they don't, you know, like who don't have the benefit of a little bit more education on my side in terms of the history of France, right? And yet this is about our shared experience, right? So I, I am curious about your thoughts about bringing this into the world of community college teaching um, effectively and eloquently. Well, I think that um, I don't bring my artwork a whole lot into my courses because I'm teaching art history, but um, I am really interested in the discourse and the conversation. And so I experienced that discourse um, in, ex- in exhibits, you know, and there's a, and there's an, I'm, what I'm doing with my art now is the stuff that I would have uh, proposed as a PhD work. I'm having a go at applying it to my art practice. And then I'm in these ex- exhibitions that are where that discourse is possible with some people who are from academia, some are from the art world, some are just, you know, in the community. So it has that kind of uh, rich, diverse perspectives. In terms of the classroom, I do talk about the things that I know. So like these images I do bring into my classes and I talk about in a different context. I talk about daguerreotypes and sort of the um, arguments in the uh, you know 19th century where they were trying to suggest that black people were some other kind of human species. And um, I talk about abolitionism. I talk about, you know, where I can bring in that diversity. I do Mm -hmm. um, into the classroom. This is something I bring into the class, these juxtapositions. And I prompt students and invite them to, um, how can I say it, to um, challenge the, so, an example that comes to my mind is, you know, the Crusades. So I invite them, they do research papers so they can look at the Crusades from uh, multiple perspectives or look at the Crusades from a Muslim perspective or look at look at it from a purely economic perspective. Um, so I'm trying, I'm always working on that as I'm sure you are trying to develop prompts that are, and usually my prompts, the more complex they are in terms of weekly discussions, um, the more low stakes I try to make them so that we can learn how to talk about, I think that's something that as, as, um, educators, we can be really proactive and is teaching our student population to really talk about challenging topics in a civil way and with respect to the various perspectives, right? So that's some, that's why I was re- reached out to you and said, hey, what do you got on opposing viewpoints? You know, because I, I think our society needs that. <clears throat> well, it's interesting because the ballet painting, the Giroux painting of ballet is from what I know about it, is is a major 
historical center of contention in terms of interpretation, right? And the various ways that it's been interpreted really are part of this construct of this thing that you do called art history, right? Which at least if you, if you turn the clock back to when I began teaching in community college was very hyper Eurocentric and has only gradually over the intervening 30 years begun to include uh, traditions from other than Europe, right? So that we can talk about, so that we can't, and we must talk about <laughs> African iconography. Um, and you can't discuss Picasso without that, by the way, right? Like, hello, <laughs> but that wasn't a conversation that one could have very often, at least in my experience. Like, again, I'm not an art historian, so I, I'm sure that these, these things were going on, but to me, both in American literature um, and in art history, there's been this, this, this steady and gradual, sometimes painful and sometimes very fraught um, and contested battle over changing the lens so that it's not exclusively Eurocentric. Yeah. But I think the, the ballet painting is right there in the middle of it. I mean, you know, it's kind of like this, the people argued to death over that thing. Careers were built and destroyed over totally. what that black body actually represents. Totally. And I don't mean to say that it was a piece of cake at all because it was not. No. <laughs> and um, there's an incredible resistance to, um, to what I did a lot of pushback. I think that this project was even given to subsequent scholars who dismissed it in two sentences. Um, for me, that was just a lazy approach. That's really convenient, right? To, to, you know, the thing is like, if you look to paintings like this and you're looking for the kind of evidence constructed from the European point of view, you're not going to find it because this was real. This was a revolution. This was an uprising by enslaved people who had been brutalized. They're not going to have a written documentation of their plans to overthrow the French military in Saint-Domingue. You're not going to find that, right? So part of what I did was researching against the grain, right? Yeah. Looking at the laws that were passed that forbade people to, forbade drumming, forbade gatherings bigger than such and such size, forbade gatherings at in the night. You know, how is information passed through the colonies, you know, we tend to view history from a land based perspective and the perspective of the winners. But if you uh, unhinge another theory that I love is this one called hierarchy. If you situate your perspective of looking at history from the sea, completely different stories and economies start to open up, right, of how information was passed, how goods were traded, how ideas were traded. So it's really doing research against the grain. And, um, and then, you know, because you're not going to have that kind of evidence, you know, you have to have multiple frameworks. So I think I was looking at, you know, formal analysis, I was looking at uh, the history of, of San Domingue and relying on work that other scholars had done. So kind of three different um, ways of arguing um, my point, right? Well, and what I'm thinking is back to the question of how does one teach this in a community college classroom? These are not just academic tempests in a teapot, quite the opposite. Like these are the academic revolutions that allow our students who are non-white, non-elite, non-privileged to see themselves and find their own voices in art history classrooms and literature classrooms. And it's not, it's not a construct that's placed upon these um, ahistorically, like reading backwards. Mm -hmm. These were the voices that were embedded in these discourses when they were made. Exactly. And, the, and the French slave owners and Napoleon knew darn well that there were these other ways of communicating and that they were, because there were other ways of communicating, they were losing the military and economic battles, right? 
So it's not news to them. That's why, that's why they forbade drumming. Exactly. That's why they forbade this kind of iconography. Like they were fully well aware of the depth and the power of these other forms of communication that then get erased from art history for way too long. And then in a really subtle, but not so subtle way, then erase the voices of students from the classrooms too, because there becomes only one way to engage. And it's from this Eurocentric perspective. And you have to know a lot of European history to read these iconographies, but you, that reading them solely from a European perspective is just not, it's not adequate to the power of what's being represented. So I love what you're doing, but I do think it's profoundly pedagogical. It has, it is deeply rooted in classroom practice and it allows students to find their own voices in ways that are really different from the old school art history uh, mentality. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that and it's, um... It hasn't been easy. <laughs> it, it has, uh, you know, I think that's part of my reason of being in community college that this kind of work and scholarship can have a profound impact on our students. And that's the battle that I want to be in rather than trying to, that's what I meant in the beginning when I said, do I want to be in a seminar with 12 people yeah. writing for a year to kind of, you know, have them just have the openness to consider an alternate perspective on a painting that is so deeply meaningful for a black culture, right? right? I just, I didn't buy it that they were like, wow, that's an amazing neoclassical painting. The Haitians, you know? Right, right. Well, so I'm glad you, <laughs> of course, and that's partly that's, you know, you came from community college, um, you've returned to community college, um, you've been a student, now professor, um, with some luck, will your daughter will join us someday. Uh, I do feel like there's this like sort of chain of generations that that happens within the teaching profession that we've spoken of before, but also a discussion that we had before just about the necessity of the battles, right? Yeah. Um, they're not easy. Uh, I, and I don't think either one of us wants to pretend that they're easy. And they're not, we don't win them all either. No. But they are, they are deeply worth fighting and they're, and they're worth fighting because of the students that we learn from and, and learn with and serve. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all about what we do and why we do it. So it's, it's really inspiring to see you using your life as a visual artist and using your life as a scholar and then bringing it home to the community college system, which is of course why Stanford is supporting us in the Gen Channel here because that's really what we're, that's what we're here to talk about. So thank you for, thank you for sharing so much of yourself and so much of your journey and updating your, your old professor um, and allowing me to once in a while recognize parts of my own, of my own education and what you're saying. Um, and some of my own mentors from Stanford, uh, Arturo Islas, Mary Pratt, and others who were fighting these battles when I was a grad student, <laughs> lo, these many, in another century, that's probably the best way to say it now. Um, it's really moving and powerful. So welcome, so um, thank you for joining us on the Gen Channel. I think we could wrap, uh, because I think it's also to be continued. Like you're at the beginning of a career that for me lasted now 30 years, and I, think it will be fascinating to see and to watch where you go next. So let's not even make this our last interview. Let's check in once in a while. Okay, I'd love that. And see what you've been up to uh, lately and next as the, as, the, as the battles continue and as the, as the world unfolds. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm so glad to have you as, an, as a a colleague and an ally and a friend and a mentor and and all of it well what i'm remembering i mean i'm letting my interview go a little longer but like we had 
um, we had these kind of discussions even when you were um, a, a beginning under, you know, quote unquote, beginning undergrad student. Like we always have had amazing discussions. I remember them rather vividly. Mm -hmm. So it was not a surprise to me that you went on and it wasn't a surprise. I mean, I, again, I don't want to, I don't want to imply that that was ever easy or automatic or that you don't have other skill sets. Um, but at the same time, I feel like this has been a long discussion already, right? Like we've, we've known each other for, for more than a decade. And what's fascinating to me is the ways in which the discussions that we, that we began 10 years ago are still going on now and will go on. Um, sometimes beautiful, sometimes very difficult. Uh, and yet they're powerful to me. Like this is what community college is about in my view. Like this, this discussion for me as a life, as a life, as having been married to the community college system, as we said, for all these decades now, like this is what, this is what I came for. Um, and it really, it's powerful for, for me to see that it's still there, that this thing that you, this, this, this ideal that you feel that you, that you signed up for still has a power and a voice in the, in the world and we have to keep it that way. Yeah. So, you know, I uh, want to follow up Scott, cause I remember you, you know, I went to community college. I got all revved up. I was, I was, as you say, even then I was interested. I think I was like thinking I might even go into classics and talk about how, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the Greek aesthetics were borrowed from, you know, Egypt and, 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 and yeah. you, and you warned me, uh, about these biases in academia that I had not yet fully seen. But when I got to, to Berkeley, Berkeley is a very diverse area, um, yeah. to live in really, really diverse. And I remember walking onto campus and seeing, you know, that diversity evaporate in the middle of a diverse community and then being wow. sitting yeah. in art history classes with 200 students and being the only African American in the room. Seriously. Yeah. Oh. I was I was the only African American art history major in the 3 years that I was there. Wow. So, well, which speaks to the failure of some of these paradigms, right? Like, I love art history with all my heart. I mean, I, you know, I'm not an art historian, but I'm, as you can tell, even from conversation, it fascinates me and informs me. But that also shows the ways in which it has to change. Yeah. And I can say that about my own field, too, of American literature, but we, this just can't continue. Like, that, it's ridiculous. Me it's embarrassing. You warned me. And I, you know, I, I thought deeply about those words, you know, if I was going to be up for the battle, because it was a battle. And I don't mean to say that, um, you know, it's a weird thing because the battle was there, but then I got the departmental citation. Right. You know, um, and then it was like a battle again. But now I got hired for the tenured position. So like, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like, I feel like I was fighting for something that I cared deeply about. Right. And there was a risk to it. But you fighting know? for something that you care deeply about, what else is there really? Like, and what I, else is there? there what else is there? You know, because there were times where I felt like I was talking into an echo chamber or nobody would hear, you know, what I was kind of saying, you know, for extended periods of time. But then suddenly it'd be like, yeah, carrot, <laughs> you know, you're doing, you're going in the right direction. So, and the way that I see it is that, um, I'm certainly not the only one. I've got a long way to go. There are many before me we are all laying down stepping stones and we will make the path more obvious to those who, who follow us. And so it's, it, it makes it incredibly deeply gratifying work. I feel like it's the, um, I know I'm in art history and in academia, but it's the, I do have an opportunity to do some social justice work with a, the trench that I'm in. Oh yes.
and that's what your art and your teaching are all about. And I think the interview here on the Gen Channel has has made that clear. So thanks for being with us on the Gen Channel, and please do join us again. I will. Thank you.